How many of you have actually believe that the enemy can't take what you have, which is your salvation in Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. That is something that is securely entrenched in eternity. He cannot steal it, though he will make you think he can. You cannot lose it, although he'll make you think you can. He will do everything that he can to disrupt your understanding of security. But he can't take what you have. Amen? Amen. Amen. And if we don't have to take all that time to, to guard our salvation, if we don't have to use all of that energy to protect our salvation, you know what that frees us up to do? To serve. That's right. To serve. To give back. The greatest treasure in the entire world has been discovered by you. And that is salvation through Jesus Christ. And it's time that you give that to others. Show them the way. Give them the map. Lead them on the road. Serve them into an understanding of Christ. Today we're talking about the core value of service and how that drives us forward as a church, how important that needs to be for us as a community of believers to show the world out there that Jesus is real. Far too often, far too many people meet people from church who do not demonstrate service and who do not demonstrate humility. And they are turned away from the church. And they say, if that's what God is all about, I don't want anything to do with it. No doubt, we here at Woodland have turned away our fair share. Probably not on purpose. But certainly... We have not always practiced humility and hospitality and patience. We have demonstrated haughtiness and pridefulness in our actions as individual believers and as a church. So as we refocus moving forward into the future, service needs to be in our mind all the time. In the letter to the church at Rome, Paul wrote about humble service from the body of Christ. And in chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, he shapes that or he caresses that into love. And how truly service is, in fact, love. We serve because we love. We love God and we love God. Humanity. So we are to serve. Let's look at Paul's section of his letter. Romans 12 verses 9 through 21. Paul says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. As it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now Paul creates for us here a list of things that we should do to demonstrate love. And love through service to others. I've broken down that scripture and I've pulled out all of these recommendations. And, and I'm going to list them off for you. And what I want you to do uh, when I go to the next couple screens is to, as I go down the list, I want you to pick one of Paul's admonitions. And say, I'm going to work on that one this week. In service and in love, I'm going to do my best to fill in the blank. So, just reflectively listen. And then when the one that jumps out to you takes hold of your heart this morning, I want you to write it on your bulletin or write it in, in your Bible or write it on your hand and say, that's what I'm going to do. This week. Admonitions of loving service toward others. From Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 12. Love sincerely. Cling to what is good. Honor one another above yourself. Keep your spiritual fervor. Be joyful in hope. Be faithful in prayer. Hate evil. Be devoted to one another. Don't be lacking in zeal. Serve the Lord. Be patient in affliction. Share with the needy. Practice hospitality. Rejoice with those rejoicing. Live in harmony with others. Associate with the lowly. Do not repay evil for evil. Live at peace with everyone. Leave room for God's wrath. Overcome evil with good. Bless those who persecute you. Mourn with the morning. Do not be proud. Do not be conceited. Do what is right. Do not take revenge. And do not be overcome by evil. You might say, John, those those all sound great and I've read them before, but what do they have to do with service? Sounds like they have to do with Christian living. Sounds like those are things that I need to deal with myself. How, how is that in any way impactful in serving? Because the fact of the matter is, we've got to be able to accomplish these so that we can effectively serve. We've got to have these active in our lives so that we can be good servants. We can't go out and serve while evil is overcoming us. We can't go out and serve while we are not being patient, humble, kind, or hospitable. We cannot go out and serve if we're not loving and forgiving others. Paul's list here is is how to love one another in Christ. But what I'm saying is that for us to serve effectively, we've got to have these things active in our life. 
We've got to have, have the Spirit of God activated in our life so that we can be active about the ministry of the gospel. That's why I said I wanted you to pick one of these. One of these very important character traits of Christians. And say, that's, that's lacking in my life. I need, to, I need to work on that. Why? So that I can be a better servant. So that I can be more effective in giving back to others what God has given me. That's why that list of, of character traits are so important for us today. You're right, they don't all impact serving particularly, but they all impact us and our ability to serve successfully. And we talk about service, I think the best place to go is right to Jesus. And ask the question, how did Jesus teach us to serve? Or how does Jesus himself serve others? How did the Bible demonstrate through his teaching service? So keep in mind those character traits that Paul gave us in the book of Romans. Keep particularly in mind the one that grabbed you and God said, this one's for you for this week. I need you to work on that as we listen to Jesus' own teaching on service. We'll start in Matthew 23, verses 8 through 12. Here he's warning against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees as he's teaching his disciples. And he says, But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors or teachers, for you have one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Using the example of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus says, look at them. That is not how you serve. He says, look at me. This is how you serve. The greatest among you shall be your servant. And he demonstrated that in John's gospel of the Lord's Supper with the washing of the feet. Jesus says to serve, you must put yourself below others. You must humble yourself. It says, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. What does that mean? That means I get the good pat on the back after I do a service project? No, it does not. It means that when you get to heaven, you get to hear the wonderful words. Welcome, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your eternal rest today. That's the exaltation. It doesn't come until the end. You may get a pat on the back from somebody here on earth who saw you serve, but don't ever serve for that because that's not humility. That's Pharisaic and Sadducee pride. Jesus said they've already received their reward here on earth. They, they get it every time somebody bows down to them or every time somebody says, Oh, excuse me, Master. Uh, oh, Rabbi. Oh, Teacher. They demonstrate that out in the world with their wonderful clothes and their wonderful riches and their wonderful rituals. Jesus says, humbly serve others. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 42 to 45, we see another Another of Jesus' teachings. This is after James and John request to sit at the right and the left side of Jesus in glory. Their pridefulness had gotten the best of them. They thought they were better than any of the other disciples. Hey Jesus, we're the best. So let us sit on your right and on your left. We're your favorite. 
So let us sit next to you in heaven. We do the most work. So reward us with the best gift. We're the best and the brightest of this whole motley crew. Give us a little recognition. That's not being humble. That's certainly not being a servant. We know what happened. The, the disciples all get mad at James and John. And Jesus sort of uh, breaks up the ruckus and, and, and begins to share with them in a teaching way where he says... You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many." Jesus says, if you want to be like me, if you want to demonstrate your Christ-likeness and that you deserve a seat at my right or my left, you will give your life for what I'm teaching. You will lay down your life as a sacrifice. Little did they know, all of them will lay down their lives. They didn't quite understand it here. Again, many of them were still expecting Jesus to all of a sudden grow purple robes on his shoulder and a crown out of his head and, and for him to march into Jerusalem and, and take over the city and take over uh, the Sanhedrin and, and take over the temple and, and sit himself on the throne and declare himself king of the Jews. Well, that's what all the prophecies say, right? Right? A little bit yes, a little bit no. King of kings, the Lord of lords. He will rescue Israel, but not the way they expected. Jesus came as a servant. 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's service. That's service. Then we have the Gospel of John. Following the section we read at communion, picking up in verse 12. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. When Jesus says, now that you've seen me, do what I have done. Or now that you have had your feet washed, you should wash one another's feet. Jesus here is speaking metaphorically. He is not concerned about their dusty feet. He's concerned about their servant's heart. He's concerned about their ability to give themselves until they're empty. To pour themselves out. Jesus was doing that very thing in just hours from this moment. He would pour himself out on the cross as an offering. A true servant pours themselves out for others. But that doesn't leave you empty. See, the enemy wants you to think, if you pour yourself out, you'll be empty. But what God promises us, if we pour ourselves out, He will fill us back up to overflowing. So that we can pour ourselves out again. Those who drink 
coffee in the morning or, or hot tea. You, you, you brew your tea or your coffee and, and you fill up your, your, your most special mug and you fill it to the top and it smells so good and it looks so wonderful. And what do you do with it? You just sit it down on the table and go, now I've got a full cup. I'm just going to hold on to it forever, right? No, you consume that cup. You drink it down. You enjoy it. It, it pseudo-nourishes you. You empty that cup. And magically, the coffee pot has more in it so you can fill it back up again. That's what God asks us to do. To pour ourselves out into the lives of others and nourish them with the Spirit of God. And when we are empty, simply to look to heaven and anticipate His filling up again. Through our service, we can bring more joy than that cup of coffee brings you in the morning. For some of you, I know that's a stretch. But it's true. God simply wants you to give yourself up. 1 John 2.6 says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Jesus served. He poured himself out for those he loved. He gave his life for all those who might believe. That the gates of heaven could be opened to common man. That the forgiveness of God might be spread forth across the nations. And that the goodness of the Spirit might rest upon the people in His kingdom. My challenge to you today is to serve. If we as a church commit ourselves to serve, if we, if we can take that as a core value and in everything we do and everywhere we go, demonstrate service, people will come to faith. The church will grow. And God will be glorified. Amen.